Um, I grew up in Hollywood. My mom works in Hollywood. Uh, I have met Harvey Weinstein. I met him one time. I was at the Four Seasons having breakfast with uh, a friend of mine named David Suisa, who's the editor over at the LA Jewish Journal. Uh, and uh, David introduced me to Harvey Weinstein. Uh, Weinstein was a jerk, but he did not sexually harass me, which apparently makes me the only person in the 300-mile radius he did not sexually harass. Um, so um, for what that is worth. In any case, uh, Weinstein now, obviously, they're, they're saying there are hundreds of cases in which he sexually assaulted, harassed, or raped people. Uh, so that is, uh, is shocking, but not surprising. The reason I say it's shocking, but not surprising, is that this has long been a part of Hollywood culture. To pretend otherwise is just foolish. And unlike in, for example, the Catholic Church, which is against these things, this has always been a long, if not celebrated, then winked at, nodded at, grinned at, laughed at part of Hollywood culture. It has been. The casting couch, has been, uh, casting couch has been part of Hollywood culture since the very beginning. And to pretend otherwise uh, is just to let Hollywood off the hook for a, per a certain perspective on human sexuality that is seriously perverse and leads to really dire consequences. The reason the left wants to ignore this, of course, is because the Hollywood view of human sexuality that allowed for this sort of misbehavior and evil to accrue and, and occur for literally decades on end is something that the left sort of holds in high regard, and that is the transactional nature of sex. So let's talk a little bit about the casting couch for just a second. So first of all, here's a little bit of Hollywood history. It was built on sexual peccadilloes, and in particular on the casting couch. Here is a long list of people who are involved in using the so-called casting couch. For those who don't know the phrase, casting couch means that there's a director, he has to cast a part in his film, and so he'll go to a hot starlet or upcoming starlet who has ambitions and say to her, you want a shot at this role, you want a screen test, darling, get down on that couch, right? That's what the casting couch meant, okay? Here are some of the people who engaged in it. Louis B. Mayer, right, the founder of MGM. Apparently, he sexually assaulted teenage Judy Garland. There are stories about him with Judy Garland on his lap when she was 16 years old and him fondling her breasts. Okay, so this goes back a long time. Arthur Freed, legendary producer, allegedly exposed himself to Shirley Temple when she was 11 years old. She wrote that in her memoir. Harry Cohn, a guy so hated in Hollywood that there was an old joke that used to go around uh, about Harry Cohn that his funeral would be the most well-attended event in the history of Hollywood because everyone wanted to make sure he was dead. Uh, but Harry Cohn uh, had a long history of, of sexual ab abuse, apparently. Um, Daryl Zanuck reportedly solicited prospective starlets on a routine basis. Howard Hughes uh, not only slept with starlets consensually, but apparently had a casting couch himself. And this was a running joke in Hollywood for years. Okay, it's part of the movies. All About Eve won Best Picture in 1950. It's a terrific film. I've recommended it here on the, on the, on the actual show. This joke involves Marilyn Monroe. So you're going to see here a very, very young Marilyn Monroe. This is one of Marilyn Monroe's first screen roles in which she had a speaking role anyway. Um, and she plays a, a, an up-and-coming woman who's attempting to break into the theater. She has a bit part. George Sanders uh, is, is playing a theater critic named Addison DeWitt, and he's been squiring Monroe's character around. Basically, she's sleeping with him so that he will squire her around town, and then he passes her off to the producers, right? The way that he's going to pass her off to the producers is have her essentially used as a sexual object by the producers in order to solicit the part. This is an open, this is an open part of the film, right? I mean, this is part of the joke. Here it is from the film. Then you two must have a long talk. I'm afraid Mr. DeWitt would find me boring before too long. You won't bore him, honey. You won't even get a chance to talk. Claudia, come here. You see that man? That's Max Fabian, the producer. Now, go and do yourself some good. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. Now, go and make him happy. All I want is a drink. Leave it to me. I'll get you one. Thank you, that's Mr. Fabian. Well done. I can see your career rising in the east like the sun. Okay, and then she ends up getting an audition but not getting the part, and then he said, he, she asks Addison DeWitt for his advice. He says, go try the same thing in Hollywood. Okay, this is, this is in the New York theater circles. This has always been a part of Hollywood. It's always been a disgusting, horrible part of Hollywood. To pretend otherwise is to ignore reality. Okay, Harvey Weinstein is the worst example of what happens in Hollywood, but it is ridiculous to suggest he is the only example of this happening in Hollywood. Okay, there are a number of starlets who have talked about this over time. I'm talking about virtually all of the major ones have talked about. Joan Collins talked about. Marilyn Monroe described the town as being, she, she, she said that 
is from her autobiography. She said producers treated Hollywood, quote, like an overcrowded brothel. Okay, a movie that many more people have seen than All About Eve, although All About Eve is, is a great movie. The Godfather, this is part of the plot. Don't you remember in The Godfather? Right, Jack Waltz. You remember the guy who ends up with the horse head in his bed? Do you remember the conversation that leads to the horse head in his bed in The Godfather? It's Jack Waltz, this famous Hollywood producer, who's sitting with Tom Hagen, and he says to him, and this is a direct quote, Johnny Fontaine never gets that part, right? Johnny Fontaine ruined one of Waltz International's most valuable protégés. I was going to make her a big star. And let me be even more frank, just to show you that I'm not a hard-hearted man. That's not all dollars and cents. She was beautiful. She was young. She was innocent. She was the greatest piece of ass I've ever had. Right? That's in The Godfather. Everyone knew in Hollywood about this for decades. It's still going on in Hollywood right now. It's still going on in Hollywood right now. Okay, power means that power combined with transactional sex leads to sexual abuse. Okay, power plus transactional sex leads to sexual abuse. Not just for women who are openly raped and their, their consent violated, but for women who are essentially forced into the position of having to sleep with guys they don't want to sleep with in order to make their way to the top. That system has been in place for 100 years in Hollywood. And that's not a justification for the system, folks. This is me ripping on Hollywood's morality. This is me ripping on the transactional nature of sex and beauty in Hollywood. This has been true forever. Famous actresses like Ellen Barkin, she comes out and she says that Harvey Weinstein's evil, that everyone knew about them for years. But rich, famous actors and actresses said nothing. Okay, where were you? Once you became rich and famous, wasn't it incumbent on you to out these people? If you actually want to change the system, you can't wait till Harvey Weinstein gets out and then you tell your horror story about Harvey Weinstein. Okay, you want to talk about hollow bravery? To me, that's hollow bravery. Because now Harvey Weinstein's already outed. You want actual bravery? Tell us who the bad guys are so that we can root them out. If you want to change the system, you have to get rid of the bad guys. And the only people who are capable of making that move are people who are already the stars. They're the people who are already the stars. Because if you're up and coming, if you're 18, you're trying to get a job in Hollywood, you're trying to make your way, it's sort of like the deal that a lot of baseball players made with steroids in the early 2000s. right? You can either languish in AAA or you can take the steroids and go for the millions of dollars. Is that an immoral decision? Yeah, it's an immoral decision. Is it an understandable one? It's also an understandable decision. The same thing happens to be true with a lot of these young Hollywood actresses and actors who come to Hollywood looking for a career, and the difference between them being Tom Hanks and them being a guy working at the coffee bean is what they're willing to do in a bedroom with a producer. The only way that that system gets broken is if the people who are already stars dedicate themselves to rooting this out, and that means naming names, because bad people will continue to do bad things so long as they have these jobs. Names have to be named. Okay, the, and back to the transactional sex point. Again, men in power have always used sex for transactional purposes, and this doesn't just exist in Hollywood. This has existed in public schools. It exists in churches and synagogues. It exists in, in politics. Obviously, Bill Clinton comes to mind. Right? This is what Bill Clinton did to Kathleen Woolley. All of this it, it has been happening for years, but it only stops when the public shows that they are not willing to accept the transactional nature of sex, that sex means more than just, I'm trading sex for a part. I'm trading sex for a role. I'm trading sex with power, for power. There is a value to sex beyond the, the ever-present physical stimulus. It is more than just shaking hands. So long as society treats sex that way, it's going to be very difficult to curb these impulses. It's going to make it harder to curb these impulses. Either sex means something or it doesn't. If sex is just a handshake, well then, a handshake can close a business deal. But if sex is more than that, then we ought to look askance at the casting couch, even if the women are consenting to be on it. Because that sort of consent is not real consent, in my view. That sort of consent is, is a power relationship. You know, this is where I'm more feminist than a lot of people on both the right and the left. That sort of power relationship is an exploitation of women. And society needs to disapprove of this. Has can it be done? Sure, society did in the past. In fact, society so disapproved of the Hollywood treatment of sex in the 1920s that the Catholic Legion of Decency led a boycott against Hollywood, and that boycott led Hollywood to actually reflect these, the, the values of the time in its own films. They, they had a voluntary thing called the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code existed from the 1930s to the 1960s, and that's why you have all of these movies where every, every kiss is closed mouth, where there are no sex scenes, why from the 1930s to the 1960s, you don't see people in bed together, why men and women sleep in separate beds. All of that is a reflection of the Hayes Code. Did the Hayes Code go too far in some ways? Yeah, I think it did. But was it a reflection of the fact that the American people were not willing to go along with Hollywood's view of sex? Yes. And the American people have to not be willing to go along with that view of sex. And they have to extend a better, a, a more sanctified view of sex into their own lives as well. 
So I think that that's, that, that's what I have to say about Harvey Weinstein. I think also, by the way, that every community should look to its own here. I do think that every community should look to its, its own issues with regard to sexual power dynamics uh, and see whether they are upholding standards of their communities or whether they are undermining those standards. This, again, I think is the difference between churches and synagogues in Hollywood. I think, as I showed you in this movie, this has always been an openly accepted part of Hollywood culture. It was never an openly accepted part of church culture, which is why it's so ridiculous that the media have decided to make you know, every time there's a sexual scandal in the Catholic Church, the media decide that they're going to make this about priests being celibate. But when there's a sexual scandal in Hollywood where sex scandals are the rule, not the exception, then it's, well, why are we making a big deal about Hollywood? This happens everywhere. Because in one area, it's endemic to the culture and celebrated in the culture, and in one, it is abhorred. Okay.